coming in March from the VLGA is the first 2024 session in the highly regarded Fast Track series, looking at the critical issue of leading under pressure. Fast Track is targeted professional development for mayors and councillors, dealing with the topical and timely issues of our time. Speakers and registration details will be announced soon. Get ready to fast track your way to the 2024 elections with the VLGA. I'm Chris Eddy coming to you from the land of the Wadawurrung people with the latest from the local government news roundup. This is your weekend update recorded on the 16th of September 2023. Coming up, a new Victorian statewide levy on short stay accommodation under consideration as the government continues to contemplate changes to council planning powers. A council forced to refund domestic animal fines due to a technicality. The Insurance Council calls on Campaspe Shire to reconsider a controversial planning decision. A New South Wales Council takes the next step towards de-amalgamation. I'll also have mayoral election results from across New South Wales, CEO appointment news and a by-election result from Darwin. Plus, the UK Council defying a government call to end its four-day workweek trial. Just some of the local government stories getting our attention today. There's much more ahead. Let's round them up now. The Local Government News Roundup is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, and by Snap Send Solve, in the business of keeping shared spaces safe, clean and great to be in. Let's start with our Victorian Roundup. And a suite of state government housing reforms are expected to be unveiled next week, according to media reports. The Age reported on Friday that the reforms are likely to include a new levy on short-term accommodation that would apply statewide and could be as high as 7.5%. The proposal, reported to be going before Cabinet next week, would see the first such statewide levy in the country, ahead of New South Wales and Queensland, which are also understood to be considering similar measures. Airbnb is believed to have a preference for a statewide approach, rather than each council introducing its own regulations, which has started to occur around the state. The Age report suggests the changes to the planning role of councils might yet be some time off as the government considers the role of new metropolitan planning boards in priority precincts to take on some of local government's current planning powers. The Mayor of Brimbank City Council is the latest to issue a strong statement rejecting potential changes to all councils as a result of one council's conduct. Councillor Bruce Lancashire says his council strongly opposes any attempts to use the findings of IVAC's Operation Sandon to water down the role of all councils in planning processes. He said he wholeheartedly agrees that the behaviour described in the report is absolutely unacceptable, but the behaviour should not be seen as a reflection of the conduct of elected representatives as a whole. In related news, Brimbank has endorsed three draft motions for the next MAV State Council meeting in October. The motions relate to urgent matters of concern, including Melbourne Airport Rail, an upgrade of the Calder Freeway and housing affordability and homelessness. The Star Weekly reports that the Council sees the State Council meeting as an opportunity to help influence state government investment and policy on its advocacy priorities. Nearly $10,000 in fines issued by Hume City Council will be refunded after a discovery that they were invalidly issued due to an advertising oversight. For the regulations under the Domestic Animals Act to be enforceable, a notice is required to be published in the Government Gazette and the local newspaper. The Star Weekly has reported on the discovery that no corresponding notice was published, rendering the Council's enforcement actions invalid. The issue was raised at this week's council meeting with confirmation that fines will be refunded and unpaid infringements cancelled. An order to give effect to the regulations is expected to come before the council for approval in October. Campaspe Shire Council is under pressure to reconsider its approval of a townhouse development which the local catchment management authority says is likely to result in danger to residents because it's located on flood-prone land. ABC News has reported that the Insurance Council of Australia has written to Mayor Rob Amos 
raising concerns about the decision to approve construction of 16 townhouses on land that was inundated in last year's major flood event. The Insurance Council's advocacy lends support to concerns expressed by some residents and the leader of the Victorian Nationals, Peter Walsh, who has met with residents, has passed their concerns on to the Victorian Planning Minister. The Council has issued a planning permit with conditions after a ruling in July by VCAT that went against residents and the Catchment Management Authority. CEO Pauline Gordon said the Council had made its decision in full compliance with the Campaspe planning scheme. Mooney Valley City Council has announced a new public-private partnership agreement which it says is unprecedented and will see nearly $11 million of capital investment in the Riverside Golf and Sports Centre. The Council says the partnership with Bluefit, a leisure facility management company, will resolve long-standing infrastructure issues and realise a major activation of the Riverside Sport and Recreation Precinct. Mayor Pierce Tyson said the deal would allow the resolution of operational issues that currently restrict usage due to the proximity of a golf driving range alongside netball and tennis courts. He said the partnership is underpinned by a 20-year management contract which enables the Council to oversee operations and ensure the community's needs are met. Here are the Victorian briefs. Applications are open for the CEO position at Greater Shepparton City Council. It follows a decision of the council to advertise the position prior to the expiry of current CEO Peter Harriet's contract in January after more than eight years in the role. MacArthur is handling the recruitment with applications to close on the 4th of October. Bass Coast Shire has won an award for excellence in sustainable pavement innovation. The Council's Recycling Island Resources Project has been recognised with the top prize at the Oststab Awards, which recognises excellence in pavement recycling and stabilisation. Acting CEO Greg Box said it was recognition that Bass Coast is a statewide leader in innovation in waste management and the circular economy. And the state government has announced a $10.7 million contribution to 11 new and expanded kindergarten services in Merribeck. The Building Blocks partnership with the council will include expansion of the Derby Street Children's Centre in Pasco Vale to provide up to 22 new kindergarten places. The National Roundup for you in just a moment. Coming up tomorrow for subscribers to the Roundup is our September interview special, which I'm now calling Roundup Unfiltered, and it's a bumper edition this month. Here's a quick preview of what's in store. First up, Fabian Datner joins me to talk about attracting and retaining people to ensure the exceptional workforce in regional councils particularly. You have to make a commitment as leaders to stay the course for minimum three years. You have to Mm. stay there. Somebody has to stop the rising, in an unladylike term, the rising shit, because if you don't take it as a leader, it's it's just going to make it a thousand times worse. And for all the lovely lads listening to this, sometimes you just have to let people vent without justifying or defending I'm also joined by Seamus Scanlon and Justin Hanney from Davidson to talk about what's on the mind of CEOs at councils around the country. 44% of the, the CEOs surveyed saw that the two highest risks, one was um, retaining uh, talent um, in, a, in a time where there's skill shortages, but the other one was the risk around councillor behaviour. And I think it continues to present itself. I know that it's it, it has some of the greatest impact on um, on CEOs and a lot of time spent by CEOs um, in that space, having to manage that space. Plus, a look at best practice community engagement from the people who wrote the book. Uh, there are many people who don't have language for what good engagement is. So we say mm-hmm. things like, oh, I haven't been consulted. And people are sitting back in council going, no, 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 we, we kept this open for six months and we ran a survey and we did this and we did that. And you had your opportunity. This is kind of like this. People don't know what good engagement could look like. That's all coming up on Roundup Unfiltered. It drops for subscribers tomorrow. If you'd like to know how to be a subscriber of the Roundup, head to our website, lgnewsroundup.com. But don't stress, it'll be out for everyone in about a week or so. You're listening to the Local Government News Roundup with Chris Eddy.
Let's look further afield now with some of the local government stories from around the country these past few days. And there's a bit going on in New South Wales. I'll have some mayoral election results for you in just a moment. A council meeting at Narrabri Shire has come to an abrupt end this week after three councillors left the chamber in protest over the mayor's refusal to allow another councillor from joining the meeting online. The country leader reports that the walkout meant the council did not have the quorum required to continue with the meeting, which was due to discuss concerns with the Shire's financial statements. Independent auditors have been unable to certify the statements due to identified non-compliance with legislative requirements. Mayor Ron Campbell said it was just a glitch and a comprehensive project would be undertaken to rectify insufficiencies with the council's underlying books and records, which could take 12 months. Councillor Greg Lamont said the report is a smoking gun and he's calling for an investigation. He also said the abrupt end to this week's meeting over the audio-visual link dispute is a demonstration of the 5-4 nature of the council and how it's not getting on with business. A de-amalgamation business case has been submitted to the local government minister by Snowy Valleys Council. Mayor Ian Chaffee said the submission was necessary to provide certainty for the community and council staff. It includes a copy of a report prepared by the University of Newcastle on the advantages and disadvantages of de-amalgamation, which Mayor Chaffee says articulates the views and concerns of a significant number of residents and ratepayers. Snowy Monaro Regional Council has announced the appointment of David Hogan as its new CEO. Mr Hogan's extensive experience in the corporate and government sectors includes previous time spent at Snowy Hydro, 15 years in fact. He takes over from outgoing CEO Peter Bascom in November. And there are concerns that a delay in securing state government support to fix a local swimming pool in Walgertshire will lead to a spike in river drownings this year. The Outback Shire experiences an average summer temperature of 35 degrees and Mayor Jane Keir regards the matter as an emergency situation. ABC News reports that the Shire's only pool was closed earlier this year and at least $2 million is needed to repair the 61-year-old facility. Discussions with the state are ongoing, but no funding has yet been allocated for pool repairs. Councillor Kerr is worried that residents will choose to cool off in local rivers, which she says are not safe, especially for children. Local community members are backing calls for urgent support and funding from the government. Now, it is mayoral election season in New South Wales for those councils that do not have directly elected mayors. Tamworth Regional Council has re-elected Russell Webb as its mayor. Councillor Webb was the only candidate for the position. Councillor Judy Coates was elected deputy mayor through a written ballot process. Paula Masilos has been re-elected as the mayor of Waverley Council, her third term in the role since 2019. Councillor Ludovico Fabiano was elected as deputy mayor for the first time. At Canterbury Bankstown, Councillor Bilal El Hayek has been re-elected during an extraordinary meeting this week. He and new Deputy Mayor Rachel Harika were elected unopposed. Sarah McMahon has been re-elected as Mayor of Hawkesbury for the remainder of the current council term. Deputy Mayor Barry Calvert was also re-elected. Port Stephens Council has a new Deputy Mayor, Councillor Leah Anderson, taking over the role from Councillor Giacomo Arnott, who spent the past 12 months in the role. At Vega Valley Shire, Mayor Russell Fitzpatrick has been re-elected for the final year of the council term. From next year, the Bega Valley Mayor will be directly elected for a four-year term. Councillor Cathy Griff succeeds Councillor Liz Seckold as the council's new deputy. Murrumbidgee Mayor Ruth McRae, OAM, has been re-elected unopposed this week, extending her time in the role to seven years. Councillor Robert Black was re-elected unopposed as deputy. Earlier this month, Strathfield Council re-elected Councillor Karen Pensabine as its mayor. Councillor Sandy Reddy was elected to the deputy mayor position, taking over from Councillor Benjamin Kai. If I've missed any, please do let me know. We'll add them to our list, which is being formed on the Local Government News Roundup website. A number of councils will hold their mayoral elections this coming week, including Kiama, Blaney, Bathurst, Snowy Monaro and Sutherland Shire. Now to Queensland, there are claims from Brisbane City Council that the Queensland government is conspiring to keep land valuations high for land tax benefits. Those claims have been disputed by the government and the state's valuer-general. 
According to a report in the Brisbane Times, Valuer General Laura Dietrich says she met with council representatives who agreed to the exclusion of Brisbane from this year's valuation program. The council's finance chair, Councillor Fiona Cunningham, has suggested that the government didn't want a valuation conducted this year because house prices have fallen, allowing land taxes to be levied on existing higher valuation figures. Ms Dietrich said local government areas to undergo the valuation process in a given year were selected based on a range of factors and only after consultation with those councils. Resources Minister Scott Stewart said it was concerning that the council disagreed with the principle that decisions on revaluations are appropriately made separate from politicians. New reforms to overhaul Queensland's councillor complaint system have been introduced to Parliament this week. Among the reforms are a new statutory preliminary assessment process, ability to declare a person a vexatious complainant, updates to natural justice requirements and changes to the details that need to be published in a councillor conduct register. LGAQ CEO Alison Smith welcomed this week's development and thanked the government for listening to the concerns of the local government sector and for introducing the reforms ahead of the next round of local government elections in March. She said that for too long the current system has been more focused on generating complaints rather than regulating conduct. Kangaroo Island Council has secured the services of Daryl Buckingham as its next CEO. Mr Buckingham will make the move from Tenterfield Council in New South Wales, where he's been CEO since mid-2021. He's also previously held the CEO positions at Flinders Shire in Queensland and the Mildura Regional Development Corporation. Tasmania's Civil and Administrative Tribunal has allowed a controversial unit development in Battery Point after it was rejected multiple times by Hobart City Council. The council ruled against initial designs in 2016 and again in 2022 due to overshadowing concerns and heritage conflicts. Pulse Hobart has reported that the developer's appeal to the tribunal has been accepted and a planning permit will now be issued. And the result of the Darwin City Council by-election in Lyons Ward is in. Last night, the NT Electoral Commission finalised the distribution of preferences, resulting in Sam Weston being elected at count number 11 in a tight race with Greens candidate Suki Doris Walker. The NT News reported that the local business owner has pledged to focus on support for small businesses, greening the city and community consultation. More news briefs for you. A new bill introduced by the New South Wales government seeks to bring voting rules for non-residential electors in the City of Sydney in line with other LGAs in the state. The government says the City of Sydney amendment bill will remove rules that favour businesses over residents in local government elections. It overturns a 2014 change that gave eligible businesses two votes compared to one each for residents. A new councillor was sworn in last week at Fraser Coast Regional Council. Jan Hegg was appointed by the council after it considered 26 nominations for the vacancy that was created by the resignation of Darren Everard last month. Councillor Hegg is a former local small business owner who previously served for three years as an alderman on the Maryborough City Council. Applications have been called for the GM position at Inverell Shire in New South Wales. Leading Roles is handling the recruitment with applications closing on the 9th of October. And Hornsby Shire Council has been named the top mobile phone recycler in the country for the fifth consecutive year. Its residents deposited more than 750 kilograms of mobile phones, chargers and accessories as part of the Mobile Muster Recycling Drive over the 12 months to March this year. Now on the Local Government News Roundup, it's time for the International Spotlight. As always, no shortage of interesting stories from the local government sector abroad this week, starting in the UK, where a council is defying the local government minister's call for a four-day work week experiment to end. It has declared the trial will continue. South Cambridgeshire District Council says the trial involving office workers and bin collectors has delivered positive outcomes including improved job recruitment and retention, cost savings and increased productivity. The Guardian reports that the Council will ignore government objections and the threat of court action and has declared the trial will continue through next March so that more data can be gathered to help assess the impact.
The local government minister, Lee Rowley, has strengthened his language in communications to the council, going from expressing opposition to the trial in June to last week saying that the experiment should end. But the minister may be swimming against the tide. The council stand comes as the Scottish government announced it will start a four-day working week trial for public sector employees by the end of this year to assess potential benefits. At Birmingham, with its well-documented financial issues, it's been revealed that the council has serious IT issues as well, which means staff cannot even produce accounts to show its true financial status. BBC News reports that external auditors have been unable to sign off on end-of-year financial statements. The auditors also say the city's massive equal pay claims mean the statements are materially misstated. It has a £760 equal pay claim bill on top of £1 billion in compensation already paid and faces an immediate budget shortfall this year of £87 million. All non-essential spending at the city has been suspended following the filing of a Section 114 notice. To the US, controversial developments in New Orleans, where the city council has made moves to terminate the mayor's communications director for alleged incompetence, neglect of duty and gross misconduct. It's the first time the council has attempted to fire an unclassified employee. Council members have accused Gregory Joseph of lying under oath about alleged use of public funds for political purposes. WGNO reports the council gave the mayor, Latoya Cantrell, until the end of the week to terminate Mr Joseph. Otherwise, it will proceed with a hearing to proceed with his termination on the 3rd of October. There'll be a new mayor in Music City, USA, after a landslide win for former council member Freddie O'Connell. According to the Tennessean, Mr O'Connell has secured 64% of the vote and will become Nashville's 10th mayor on a platform of making it easier for people to stay in the city, starting with investments in schools, parks and libraries. The election has also resulted in 22 women on the Metro Council, which for the first time in the city's history means women make up the majority, including the council's first openly transgender person. And from New Zealand, Marlborough District Council Mayor Nadine Taylor has criticised a fellow councillor for refusing to step away from a discussion about funding for the Marlborough Research Centre, where he is the chief executive. According to the website Stuff, Councillor Gerald Hope did not declare a conflict of interest and justified the centre's funding requests. The council's code of conduct requires councillors to maintain a clear separation between personal interests and their duties as councillors to prevent bias. The centre plans to spend over $300,000 on 16 projects this financial year, including meteorological services, experimental vineyard phenotyping and pine nuts research. Mayor Taylor has expressed concern that some projects seem more focused on the private sector than research activities, and she suggested aligning funding with the Council's desired outcomes in future. And with the departure of the CEO at Gore District Council and the scrapping of an independent review, you'd be forgiven for thinking the Council would get a rest from the headlines for a while. Not so, it seems. The media is attempting to get access to details of any payout for departing CEO Stephen Parry, supported by calls from a former CFO now living in the UK. Stuff has made an official request for the information, but the council is refusing to comply on the grounds of privacy. Former employee Doug Walker says the information should be public and that any payout would be unbudgeted and unfunded expenditure that would require the raising of additional debt. Mr Walker has alleged that his issues with Mr Parry affected his mental health and led to him leaving the country. Stuff has now lodged a complaint with the New Zealand Office of the Ombudsman about the Council's refusal to provide details or even confirm whether there is a payout for the departing CEO. Never a dull moment in the wide, wonderful world of local government. And that's your roundup for the 16th of September 2023. Brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Snap Send Song. As always, you can find links to the stories referenced in this episode along with a full transcript at lgnewsroundup.com. While you're there, check out the latest breaking news updates and learn how you can support the Roundup by becoming a subscriber through a small monthly contribution, which you can cancel at any time. Subscribers, keep an eye out for Roundup Unfiltered, our September special edition, dropping in your queue tomorrow, Sunday, the 17th of September. 
The local government news roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I'll have more of the latest local government news for you next week. Until then, thanks for listening and bye for now. Coming in March from the VLGA is the first 2024 session in the highly regarded Fast Track series, looking at the critical issue of leading under pressure. Fast Track is targeted professional development for mayors and councillors, dealing with the topical and timely issues of our time. Speakers and registration details will be announced soon. Get ready to fast track your way to the 2024 elections with the VLGA. (laughs) 